So um, I think uh, we've decided that the first work we want to uh, talk about is a work that um, uh, happened in 2012, uh, I think, uh, and um, it's called uh, The Wreck of Hope uh, and the Other Side of Impatience. Um, and uh, I'm going to just start by reading a little um, a little text where he uh, describes this work with, and um, and we'll pick out a few words that uh, are very important to what he's practiced, and that through that uh, I'll kind of uh, from that point on I'll just be asking what he uh, questions about. Um, particularly these uh, instances that are, uh, or these terminologies that when he uses a lot in his book. Um, so perhaps we can see the other image, uh, the big image. Yes. So, <clears throat> absences generated by those forci forcibly disappeared during civil war cannot be understood as mere national, no, sorry, mere notional negatives of presence. In other words, absence is not merely the, the non-presence of a disappeared to be fulfilled by his or her return. This work grapples with absences and attempts to posit the negatives. Here, given form <clears throat> in the mold of the central section of the Caspar David Friedrich painting and the emptied tomb of the Holbein painting. So as we can see here, there are two elements. The first is the Caspar David Friedrich. And do we have the images? Um, is the painting by Caspar David Friedrich originally uh, not originally, but actually named by many people, the, the Wreck of Hope. Uh, and we'll be talking about this in a minute. But um, and this is the painting, the Hans Holbein painting, uh, Dead Christ. <clears throat> um, are already substantive entities um, because displaced from being merely the notional negatives or emptiness of a presence temporarily forced into disappearance. The conversation between the mold, the rectangular box in the wall, and the wall labels, and wall labels are always very essential for what is happening. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> carrying the correct museum information begins, um, initiates um, a conversation with absence, which is the concern that subtends my work and will continue to do so for a long time to come. To be more explicit, there is a displacement between the official title of the painting, the Caspar David Friedrich painting, The Sea of Ice, and the more popular title, which is The Wreck of Hope, between the indication by the wall label of the Friedrich painting and the inter, uh, inverted negative mold of the central section, based on that same painting, between the wall label of the Holbein painting and the empty box tomb, which is no longer tugged by the dialectic of the Holbein image, that is between the deadness of the body of Christ and the expectation of its resurrection as argued for by uh, for uh, as argued for example by Michael Onfray who sees in the outstretched middle finger of the dead body of Christ an allegorical iconographical detail which promises a coming resurrection in this shift in these shifts or displacements to be more precise this work attempts to give substance to absence that cannot be undone by a returning presence or sidestep, sidestep by hope for an eventual return, a restitution of presence. The other side of impatience is firstly the temporality of absence, which persists amidst a reluctant sociality 
<clears throat> social and prompts a political critique of presence as a fetish of ideologies dominant during the protracted temporality of post-civil war. Um, I wrote that? Yes. <laughs> it sound like somebody else. <laughs> uh, so this is, I mean, it, the, the, why, why uh, I started with this text, because it basically has the number of, um, first of all, it, it points to an important um, event, the Lebanese Civil War, um, and more importantly, the idea of uh, the, the, the missing people, or the people who are absent, uh, be because of the civil war, which um, seems to be a, a recurrent uh, issue in your work that you deal with. Secondly, uh, the idea of giving substance to absence, which is also uh, something that uh, that is recurrent in your work. Uh, Thirdly, um, the references to art history or to uh, the history of antiquity, to Greco-Roman mythology uh, <clears throat> that are always also influ influencing your work. Um, and finally, um, the idea of a temporality, uh, which uh, many of your projects seem to be uh, <clears throat> constructions of uh, let's say alternative temporalities um, and there's also the hint of the idea of patience and impatience which is also a current, uh, a current uh, kind of theme that appears in your work often um, so um, from this kind of let's say space of, of thinking uh, these two terminologies Perhaps you can, uh, we can start by um, kind of just uh, explaining this work, how it came by, and, uh, and you know, the meaning behind it. Um, uh, we're in front of it. In front of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I'm very happy to, to share some of my work with you and to hear your thoughts perhaps afterwards. Um, uh, perhaps one way to start right away is to say that uh, I think one of the, the major obstacles uh, that I face personally that, and I think that uh, that we face in Lebanon, uh, and I speak of Lebanon specifically, but I think some of the ideas that I deal with may extend beyond, beyond Lebanon, but one of the major problems is hope. And so one of the main tasks of my work is a, is a, is a rigorous critique of hope uh, and to think of ways of exiting uh, the dialectic of hope and despair, uh, the dialectic of uh, uh, staticness and, and, and aspiration for, for better nation state, a better future. Because I think that uh, the logic of hope uh, is a nefarious logic. It, it tends to um, it tends to place us in a transitional temporality, in which uh, the better future, or the future of justice, is always deferred because we are somehow not ready not yet ready to receive justice. But also this transitional temporality of hope is, is one where the past must always be declared as evil, as a useless, ungenerative, violent past. And in this transitional temporality, which I've come to call over the years a protracted civil war, uh, is precisely a temporality in which that renews itself the logic of a protracted civil war is in fact renewed by violence. So violence, in a sense, is what the French some would call the retour à l'ordre, a return to order. 
In other words, violence is, is employed to regenerate the logic of protracted civil war. It's quite a complex, uh, um, it's a quite a complex uh, temporal structure that I find myself in, and I ask myself how to how to how, how to critique it, right? how to resist this temporality. So one way, as I said, is the critique of hope. Let me just go into directly into an example. So this painting by uh, <coughs> Friedrich, you know, the German, I suppose. Art history books call him a romantic artist. Or this is, I think, 1824, if I'm not mistaken. It's a very small oil painting which he titled The Sea of Ice, but uh, the story goes that the, the, uh, the audience at the time uh, decided to name it The Wreck of Hope because around 1824, it seems, a, uh, a, a, a polar expedition, uh, uh, <clears throat> a, a boat, Right, uh, called Hope uh, was uh, sunk somewhere in the polar region, and when pe when people saw this painting and uh, a part of the sinking ship, they thought this was you know a documentary, a documentary painting, and they called it the Hope. And today, if you were to Google the Wreck of Hope, you would get this painting more quickly than if you were to Google the Sea of Ice. But anyways, I very much thought that uh, the Wreck of Hope is a is a way for me to begin thinking and. Uh, but of course, this is a painting that fits within the European tradition of, of the sublime, right? So looking at catastrophe from a safe distance, right? Uh, my interest is always to give substance to those who live, right? Who carry the weight, who give substance to what the sublime viewer calls catastrophe but which is not a catastrophe for those who live it necessarily. Not in the sense of a, not in the sense of a traumatic uh, disruption of a society's ability to represent its past, its present, and to represent itself in that past and in that present. It's a rather long sentence. But the idea here is that the, the sublime in a sense, presupposes uh, a traumatic event, but not to the viewer, but to the other. Since I am the other, in a sense, right? my interest is to try to give substance to what is generally considered as catastrophe. So what I try to do with, with, a, very, uh, with a very resourceful technician at KW, uh, Kunstwerk in Berlin, is to try to build this, uh, what looks like this mountain, in a sense. Uh, this is, uh, and to, to exhibit it upside down, because again, I'm, I'm interested in the underneath. Okay. Uh, so what we did was, uh, we found this technique by which the, uh, the, uh, the casting process results in a, in a quote unquote, a negative that is not, uh, that is not the negative of a positive. So you, by looking at by looking at it from this point of view, you don't necessarily see the positive. In other words, the <coughs> negative or the uh, the other side is not simply the, the the notional the notional absence of a positive. It's not the collapse of presence. This is in a sense my interest in and substantiating another, uh, if you like, uh, substantiating the life world of, of a, of a non-posthumous survivor. That is a survivor who does not continue to live in spite of his or her own death, but rather a survivor who carries the weight of historical events and with them speaks. So this is one piece, and the other is, uh, as you can see in this one, is, as, as uh, my friend Bassam was mentioning, is the interpretation of the Hans Holbein painting of Dead Christ, which um, you mentioned the Michel Offre, uh, the French historian, who wrote a fantastic short text in which he really tries hard to find a sign in the, uh, in the Holbein painting which 
which tells that the resurrection is imminent. So this painting in the history of art, in Western history of art, is a painting that is anxious because it visually uh, proffers all the sign of utter deadness, right? And then challenges the viewer to maintain his or her own belief in the resurrection. So it's again this dialectic between absence and the promise of presence again. And again, my work is trying to find a way out of these dialectics. So just take it as a, this is my story, is that Michel Onfray finds this uh, indication of, uh, of the promised resurrection in the middle finger of Christ's right hand, which, relatively speaking, is erect. Now, it seems rather that you know, the symbolism of fingers back then is different than ours. Probably the middle finger means the same thing as it does today. <laughs> but it seems that back then the middle finger is is a uh, is symbolic of uh, the pen, the writing pen, and therefore it it should send you back to the written word, the scriptures, which tell you of the resurrection. I mean, it's like you know, it's really trying hard to maintain the dialectic, to maintain the promise that presence will always come and erase absence and all its traces, in the sense that to, to vanquish ab absence. <clears throat> so simply said, I mean, these two works together, they are really about a invitation to converse at length, to linger with, to tarry with, to tarry in a conversation with absence. As I know it sounds contradictory, I suppose it is, is that, of course, we suppose that conversation is a, is a two-way dialogue, right? And I suppose the difficulty here is to, in conversing with absence, is, is to recognize, in the sense that an answer may take an eternity to return, to, to be heard by us, but nevertheless, the labor of conversing with absence, even if an answer is never heard, the, the labor itself substantiates absence rather than tries to call on a, on a, uh, on a triumphant presence to come and erase absence. So the work that I do is not about, again, uh, summoning, hoping, summoning for a presence to undo the traces of absence, but actually to linger with absence and to converse with it, and therefore to make absence into a substance, into a historic substance, a historical substance. I was speaking with my friends in the gallery before, is that, for example, there's a story, uh, uh, there's a story. Some Lebanese missing people have returned in the last few years. They they suddenly reappear. For years, we thought that they they were dead, or then they they return, having you know been in Israeli prisons or in Syrian prisons. Some of them have returned, and when they return, they are celebrated. Usually, not by all the Lebanese because of you know the political sectarian division, but they're celebrated and they're forgotten, and then that their name reappears again as <coughs> as uh, uh, as patients who are undergoing therapy uh, to be reintegrated into society. And usually the case, if I follow a few cases, is that these returnees, <coughs> as we call them, never manage to reintegrate into society. So you know, more effort is placed at you know, therapeutic processes. <coughs> My suggestion from within art is to say that the problem is exactly there, is that we still in doing, in doing so, we are still hoping that somehow the returnee who brings back with him or with her presence will come to erase the absence and the consequence of their absence, right? That somehow presence comes and fulfills absence and we can, we can uh, restart, in a sense, a kind of a normative living. My proposition and my work, maybe this one and the others, is that in their absence, our labor of conversing is with the missing is to converse with the absence. 
But this conversation never ends. It's part of what makes a society. And if they do return, they must join in the conversation with the absence that their previous absence generated. So in a sense, in a sense if absence are sort of a substance, it can never be undone with presence, which is, a, which is in a sense, at the risk of sounding uh, arrogant, but it seems like an overturning overturning a fundamental philosophical bias, which always says that presence is valuable and absence is the illness of presence. In religion, in philosophy since Plato, in Arab philosophy, in Islam, in Christianity. Uh, I mean, I grew, up, I grew up Christian, I still remember The main staples of, of uh, catechism is, is to say, you know, that the resurrection of Christ is the final defeat of death. Yes. So death is an illness because it, it's the enemy, right? And of course, I'm doing this work to do what basically is again to say that is to find a way to critique uh, the hegemony of hope. Uh, which does two things, that is, the people that I'll try to say different. One, it robs me of my history, my very complex, difficult, very interesting, but also very violent history. And secondly, it robs me of, of an ability to construct my future. Right? In the sense, it places me in a transitional temporality. I'm not yet worthy of the future to come, but I must always renege on the past that is my responsibility. An infinite uh, intermission. Yes, which yes. is also in a sense it is the, the logic of human rights discourse. Yeah. Right, that's what, what it does. Right? You are the eternal wounded victim. I mean, that's the only position that you were allowed And um, so, um, one of the ways you also do this is uh, through thinking about uh, temporalities instead of spatialities, or perhaps uh, kind of uh, constructing or an attempt to construct temporalities out of a different understanding of, of spatiality. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the uh, one of the, the ongoing projects uh, that you uh, you are developing is called Beirut Open City, um, where you um, its basis is actually uh, a differentiation between two uh, historical but also currently present uh, structures: the maze and the labyrinth. And uh, perhaps you can uh, you can tell us about uh, about Beirut Open City as a project. Okay, it's on here. Just a minute. This was uh, from uh, actually from uh, the Lofoten International Art Festival in uh, 2013, where uh, I was uh, invited to uh, be one of the three curators, uh, Anna Shepard Carlson and Eva Gonzalez Sancho. Was with the two others, and um, uh, this was uh, Waleed's uh, contribution to that uh, project. Um, okay, so uh, again, okay, a bit of history here. Ninety-eight summer of nineteen eighty-two, the Israeli army occupies Beirut. I think, I'll just say a few days later, what remained of the Communist Party and the, and the other satellite communist organization of Beirut, they, uh, they, they print out a call and they distribute it in Beirut, calling on all citizens to take arms against the Israelis. A few days later, the Israelis retreat. 
sounds heroic. Mm. But how could that happen? How could a city and its uh, residents uh, who have just lost the battle, their city has been has been physically occupied, still be able to uh, uh, produce uh, such a coal? Huh? Is it the resilience of the Lebanese? Well, yes, but these are vague notions. <laughs> my own person from Baker. So, so my question is, how could that happen? Why was Beirut in 1982 capable of, of resisting the army that occupied it geographically? And let's say in the last few years, as I, as I, as I live in Beirut, I feel that the city, uh, without an Israeli in, in invasion, is, is, um, uh, is completely occupied and domesticated by by neoliberal capital, uh, what 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 was what could have been what could have been back in 1982 uh, uh, capable of generating such a coup? So I, I you know my approach is to say that in a sense a city remains capable of resistance even if occupied physically is uh, remains capable if it maintains a hold on its time, that the time of the city is not occupied. Well, that's a difficult notion in a sense to substantiate. I think that in 1982, the city was physically occupied, but the time of the city somehow was still capable of resisting. And I, you know, you know, I did some research on the text written back then, and in a sense, I tried to elaborate theory in which I tried to distinguish between, I mean, based on the work of writers before me, like Hilal Tufi and Elias Khouri and Her Herman Kern, who's a kind of encyclopedic German researcher who researched the Babylon, try to, try to elaborate politically a distinction between the maze and the Babylon. And I know that in English, like in French, uh, these terms are used interchangeably as synonymous, so, and they both tend to mean uh, space, in which one risks getting lost. You enter a maze or a labyrinth, you have to make decisions, go left and right. If you're lucky, you may find your way out, but generally, you're lost inside. But it seems that, you know, based on some you know, archaeological research and so forth, that a maze doesn't look like a labyrinth. Uh, I'm sure you know what a maze looks like. You know, you probably see it on placemats and, you know, Sometimes restaurants, they give it to kids to spend the time waiting for the hamburger, right? So it mm -hmm. usually has one entrance and an exit on the other side. And you enter and there's all this meander and you have to find, you, know, take, make, you have to make decisions, the right decision to, to, to find your way out. So I propose the following formulation, that a maze is a spatial configuration in which um, uh, there is a possibility of passing in and out against the possibility of getting lost. Because, that is, because in a maze it is possible to get lost, that you can pass in and out. Because you can make decisions in a maze, you can get lost. In other words, I don't think it's because you can get out of the maze that you can get lost in a maze. And of course, in, 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 in modernist, uh, even like 18th century romantic and later some early modernist literature, the subject is never constituted unless he or she is found after being lost. The whole trope of the journey, right? You go on a journey to get lost, but you find yourself. Now the labyrinth, it seems to be completely different, but the labyrinth, if you could draw better, no, the labyrinth, it doesn't look like this. The labyrinth has, has an entrance of some sort. Uh, if you're in a labyrinth, <coughs> there is no, you're not called upon to make any decision. There's no left and right. Because the labyrinth is unicursal. It has one course. It is pendular. It takes you closer to the center and then away from the center. Right? And eventually you find yourself at the center. But the knowledge that led you into the center is, is not the knowledge that will allow you to leave the center. In other words, in the labyrinth, the labyrinth would be the possibility, the impossibility of passing in and out. 
against the impossibility of getting lost. Because you can't, you don't make decisions in a labyrinth, you don't get lost in the labyrinth. Good. You know, you step out of the dialectic of lose of, of loss of losing yourself and finding yourself, of going left or going right. And therefore, the, uh, the labyrinth was not a spatial configuration, it was a temporal configuration. So the proposition was that the maze that is a city, the, the spatial maze that is a spatial city, may always maintain an ability to resist if this maze, even if conquered, yeah, is capable of maintaining a labyrinthian temporality. Because in the labyrinth, a labyrinth is not something that you can defend with ramparts. Right? So, because if you build ramparts around the city to defend it, it, it you may defend the city from the from the uh, conqueror, but the, the but the walls can be destroyed and the conqueror can actually go in. But if if a labyrinth is not about conquering the inside from the outside. A labyrinthian temporality is outside again the dialectic of the the conqueror and the rampart. You're someplace else. Because also that what what makes a labyrinth is that you don't know when you are in, already in a labyrinth. You are always already in a labyrinth. Because in a labyrinth you cannot look back and say, ah, this is where I enter. Because a labyrinth is not sequential time and therefore thresholds are part of sequential. I go A to B. I hope that what I'm saying will will see will see some of it in the exhibition because we did something to the entrance of the gallery. Yeah. So uh, labyrinthian temporality is not something you intently step into. It's something you find yourself inside. Uh, you can't look back and say, "Ah, this is where I enter, and I'm going to go back from there." Uh, and therefore, labyrinthian temporality does not have a gate that you can fortify against the conquer. So the idea is to layer the maze with the labyrinth, in a sense to that the labyrinthian would be a temporality we go to, or at least we, we appeal to, in a sense, or we exercise, whenever we are entangled in the maze. Yeah. Uh, and I try to propose that perhaps if we are to find, if we are to find we are to resist in, in, in our cities that we live in, which are uh, overcome by whether you know, military conquests or, you know, or, or rampant capitalism, okay, is in a sense we need to think about the labyrinthian, uh, to think about how can we make cities that exit the dialectic of the fortification and the, and the conquest. In other words, how do we build cities in which we never get lost into, but cities that we never leave? And this is strange talking about a city that I just left, but you know, <laughs> the idea is that I, th I think if, for me, Beirut, for example, is a city. I will. I'll try. I will try not to not to live past my city, not to overlive my city. But I will. I'm definitely trying not to let Beirut overlive me, live past me. You know what I mean? Can you better? It's explain? it's like a, this is based on a film, but the idea is if you think of think if you think of it as a, as a as a vampire, I will feed off my city. I need my city to feed off, right? But as a vampire, the city will not live beyond me. Okay. Uh, since we are converging. And this is the kind of uh, generative critical entanglement that I think would make our cities creative again to feel that you can never leave it, that it will never leave you. Uh, so the option, the option of saying, uh, you know, when things get, get bad, I'll just you know, pack my bags and leave, which is an option that many Lebanese, interesting, you know, every Lebanese house has a, has a suitcase packed. Well, not everyone, so 
for certain classes. Right? Um, so I, I, I think maybe I've drifted a bit, but if I'm trying to politically contextualize my interest in, in the laboratory, it's not an aesthetic interest. Mm. Um, it seems to me necessary to reconsider how how one lives one's own city. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, where the city becomes faithful, like your fate, but unlike a religious believer who's faithful, we should take our fate very seriously if that's possible. Right? Usually your fate is something you surrender to. But if you take it seriously, you think it through, you, th you think your fate seriously, you labor at it religiously. Mm -hmm. So one of the pieces I'd like to show you, I'm sorry, I'm no, but yeah. just before we yeah. just before we leave that piece, yeah. uh, because it's also <laughs> related to the Edward Munch issue. Yes. Uh, so can you can you kind of uh, just tell us about the link here uh, and how that converges with uh, yeah. with you know what you just told us? Okay. So there's a, there's a painting by Edward Munch uh, called. The boy in the sick room. Sometimes it's called the sick room or the death room, and he's done quite a few of them. Uh, usually, he has a sure you've seen there's a bed, uh, but the sick person is not on the bed or in the bed, but you see the family members around the bed, and they're all uh, affected by by the by the illness or the death in different ways. And there's always a boy, a young boy, as if to, uh, uh, reaching out, as if trying to leave the room. Sometimes in the painting where it's lith lithographed, uh, Munch does not paint a doorway or a window or anything, it's just the gesture. It's, it's always this gesture of a boy as if trying to grab the, the handle, right, to leave. So again, you can see how that, how that could be interesting in the sense of, again, reinterpreting this, uh, this aspiration to leave, right? to turn it into the substance of a desire to linger. Right? So I did this room with, uh, with Bassam. I mean, this is so one of the rooms in, the, in, a, in an old house in the Fort Marino. So I asked that the, 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 the floor be raised and that against the back wall, a black strip be painted. Well, if you're lucky, you could. Could seem to be exactly where a door handle is. I'm not sure if that works in this slide, more or less. But if you enter the room, of course, and you walk towards that black strip, suddenly the door handle is too low to be a door handle. And I suppose the threshold of sequential time, as you look back, is lost because the door handle was someplace and it's now someplace else. So it's an invitation again to enter and to linger. I mean, this idea of staying of tarrying exactly where, in the place where there's a, where there's a death. Right? So again, the idea of uh, mourning in the presence of the corpse, right? So rather than to bury the corpse, turn your back, as Freud says, and to begin the process of mourning, which will take you back to a, to a normative life, is actually to say that the corpse cannot be buried but is it possible to have a conversation to build a sociality in the presence of the corpse? And I suppose to begin to think that you have to, you have to enter and get rid of any hope or aspiration to leave. There's no outside. There's only here. Uh, maybe there are other pictures. So on the inside, it would look like this. This is looking back out, I suppose, but the door handle is no longer there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's like that. Okay. Uh, but I'm not sure, of course, it will cover it. Okay. okay. So, okay. Um, you were about to switch. I, I kind of I interrupted you just to kind of for this extra detail. But, mm -hmm. but you were about to switch into something else. If you want. Of course, it will come up. But oh, it's okay. Not the right time. Okay. So, um, about the corpse. Yes, uh, about the about the corpse. Um, there's a text uh, which.
which is actually the text that uh, we have in uh, in the publication, mm -hmm. uh, the main text in the publication. There's a an introduction by Kailan Mansur Godi about uh, Walid's work and kind of a little bit historicizing the, the context where uh, Walid's work starts from. Uh, but then there's um, the actual text. Um, uh, which is called uh, <laughs> the, in, the in, in the presence of the corpse, uh, which is actually the kind of uh, let's say the, the text that this work uh, relates to, and uh, even the work that we just talked about actually kind of relates to too. Uh, but there was a, there's another text that we we, uh, we didn't have enough space for in this publication, uh, which is. Uh, uh, also talks about, discusses the corpse, uh, who, who starts with this uh, tale. Uh, I think it's in this one, but I'll mention it. Okay. Yes, uh, perhaps you can, you, you can you can tell us about this tale, yeah. and so then we like, can move on to this. I, I, found, I found this uh, myth, a story, that I'd like to show you. Maybe, maybe it's something I've read it before, but there's a story about a king who was told that he must uh, walk through a very uh, a burial ground, and at the end of the burial ground, where he will find a tree, on the tree hangs a corpse. He's supposed to cut down the corpse, carry it on his on his back, and walk with it and cross back the burial ground. A task. So the king does that. He crosses the burial ground, finds a tree, climbs, cuts the the corpse, and as the corpse falls on the ground, it makes a sound. So he thinks that there's life in it, uh, and I think addresses the corpse, but when he addresses the corpse, the corpse flies back onto the tree. So he goes back and cuts it down, carries it on his back, and as he's walking, the corpse speaks. It says, I will pose a riddle, and if you do not give me the solution to the riddle, you, your head will explode. So the riddle is, is, uh, is posed, and the king thinks me and finds a solution. The moment he gives a solution, the corpse flies back to the tree. So he does it again and again, and then every time he carries it, the corpse poses a riddle, he finds a solution, the, the corpse flies back to the tree. And on the 25th time, I think, carries the corpse, and the corpse poses a riddle, and the king, for the first time, is befuddled, I would say. He's nonplussed, he doesn't have an answer. So he's carrying, he's walking briskly, and he is bemusing or soliloquizing, he's talking in his head, he's soliloquizing, doesn't have a solution. So he lingers with the corpse on his back, and then suddenly the, the voice says, Sir, you may have this corpse, I will now, I will now quit it. So the voice leaves, and the tale ends with the king carrying the corpse, because he did not find a solution to the, to the riddle to get rid of the corpse. It is stories like this, and I, there are many of them that I found. This, these idea, these moments when the living carry or linger with the corpse, and the corpse it seems when it's not buried, when it's with us, at least based on this. Uh, the story and and some personal experiences is that when the corpse is with us, we tend to quiet down, stop talking to one another, and instead soliloquize, talk in our heads. So we go from you know, a vocalizing conversation to an interred conversation, an intense interred conversation. And it's one of my big questions, the questions of my work is that, well, one is to insist on lingering with the corpse, on postponing the burial of the corpse, and on initiating a mourning, which is completely counterintuitive, a mourning in the presence of the corpse, around which we will, we will soliloquize intensely until, and this is, I mean, this is one of the main challenges that I find, is that how do we go from the soliloquy to actually vocalizing the conversation amongst us and building the sociality and the presence of the corpse. Just to give you a little example from 
where I come from, let's say in Lebanon, due to the uh, to the political sectarian divisions, you know, the Lebanese as a general, of course, I mean that's uh, you know, if there, if there is a general Lebanese body, which doesn't exist, right? But we, we do, there's no consensus over the names of the dead and over the meaning or the significance of their dead. But every group uh, has it has its own martyrs, but they're not shared. So, so and it sounds like metaphorically, but but sometimes literally, the corpses are never buried because we disagree. And for a long time, again, the issue was in Lebanon is that how can we initiate a social conversation that would lead us toward a consensus over the debt, the significance of why they died, what they died for, and an agreement that in a sense we have all suffered, as if sufferance right, can be quantified and made egalitarian. I mean, this was the 10 years of conversation that between 1990 and 2000, everyone else trying to get there. It didn't work. So of course I'm, I'm growing up in this kind of conversation, and I th thought that perhaps we should do the the counterintuitive, which is, what if the, the corpse cannot be buried? What if suffering is not egalitarian? What if what seems in general to be an obstacle to mourning, which is the corpse, because Freud says in one of his classical okay, uh, canonical texts is that, uh, although it's much more complex, if, but anyways, he says that, uh, he says the ego is, of course, extremely selfish, necessarily selfish. And fearing, uh, fearing a fate similar to the dead body, the ego will quickly find a way to turn its back to the dead body, to the corpse, <coughs> and begin walking back towards normative living. In other words, you have to, he says, uh, abolish the corpse for mourning to begin. But again, his text is much more complex. But I mean, there's that suggestion, that simple suggestion that mourning does not begin unless the corpse is buried. But what if the corpse can't be buried? Can't we start another kind of mourning? Uh, I think reading Freud closely, you see how he is in a sense, although he's trying to propose a, I mean, as a, as a, as a clinical, uh, <coughs> in from, from a position of a clinical psychoanalyst, he's, he has to, Propose a normative solution, but the, the his text seems to be almost proposing that, in a sense, there is, there is no such thing as a successful mourning. Mourning is, in fact, interminable. And of course, somebody says that you know one of the the risk is that we would fall into melancholy and so on. But that's you know, not good. Right? The idea is that is it possible to begin a process of mourning that remains with the corpse, that the object of after death, namely the corpse, rather than be being an obstacle to a process of mourning, to a process of socialization, might actually be, might be in, in fact the condition for it. That without the corpse, without, without the visibility, the tangibility right, of our failures, right, of our attempted changes to history, right, if it's not kept visible among, between us, there's no way of, in a sense, building a livable future. So this idea of, of lingering with the corpse, of mourning in the presence of the corpse, it's not an invitation to, to grieve internally. On the contrary, it's rather a, an invitation to, to ponder a livable sociality in which the corpse is an essential component. The idea of, for example, memorials and uh, you know the, the, the construction of uh, you know states usually construct when there's some kind of uh, collective uh, trauma or supposed collective trauma, they usually construct some kind of memorial. Yes, and there's a text of yours that deals with with this from this concept of, of uh, yes uh, the, uh, particular concept. So we'll, pa we'll just to go over this quickly, then uh, quickly, very quickly. Uh, I, I tend to I tend to propose that uh, 
commemoration, memorialization, the building of monuments, is, is nothing but uh, an attempt to give form to, uh, to vengeance, to revenge. What memorials do is that they select a very specific historical narrative and call on us to practice that particular exclusive and exclusionary memory. And in Lebanon, at least, but the world I live in, these are always repetitions for coming revenge. So the question again become, becomes, how does one defend the dynamic, the wayward, the unproductive, but necessary labor of forgetting, so that we can, in a sense, resist and critique and dismantle any attempt at, monu at monumentalizing an ex exclusionary form of the past. And instead of doing that, what we should do is, in a sense, open up, open up the labor of forgetting, right? the labor of, the labor of, in a sense, the labor of remembering so much that no monuments can ever be built. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe we can have a few minutes for some questions from the others, if anyone has a question. I have a question. Maybe. Oh, unless somebody else put up their hand. Just, yeah, there's another, um, you know, like, uh, for, for, uh, what do you just ask me to mention something? Besides the, uh, the removal of the door and the threshold uh, to the actual gallery space, um, there's something else that has been removed. <laughs> and uh, this was uh, perhaps a, uh, uh, something that, that happened, you know, that came to his mind while he was here after we printed the publication. Well, the original title of the project was uh, Inside, comma, comma, Mourning in the Presence of a Corpse. Mm, so it, it, this kind of uh, little intermission in the middle, we, the way you would say inside, mourning in the presence of a corpse. Now is now it's inside mourning in the presence of a corpse. There's, there's, the the so comma has been yeah, removed. So we, removed. We said that's not a erase the comma, as you can see. Well, they did it by hand, book by book. <laughs> uh, but I like the fact that you probably can still see the comma and the attempt to, to erase it. So maybe mm -hmm. going yeah. from the inside, which is a, a spatial index, to the inside, which is temporal, one is not so easy, but it was an, it was an attempt to. So I mean, the differentiation here is actually what this this removal. Uh, what, it, what what do you think it's done in terms of like uh, the, the actual concept? I think go from space to time, but as but I think I like the fact that the the white out that we used is not so performing, so that you can still see the comma. So I think it's never a clear shift, right? But could you elaborate slightly on how we go from space to time? <laughs> At least linguistically. Right? Yes. So the comma says inside, blah, blah, blah. And now it's like inside morning. I mean, morning is not a space. It is a. It's a temporality. It's temporal. So if there is such a thing of being inside morning rather than to go inside where morning is and perhaps to step with it outside, I think the invitation is like. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going inside tonight. I think it's, I'm going to postpone going inside. I'm not ready for it. <laughs> if you go. <laughs> uh, I think it was pretty good. <laughs> <Just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask about, I was going to ask you to speak about the comment. So. Uh, I might have a, a question just in terms of your conversation around the dialectic of, of hope and despair. 
um, which is very it's it's very evocative in in my own country in South Africa, and I was wondering if perhaps and I you know this might not be a, a, an artistic response it might be your personal conceptual response to I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the notion of reconciliation yeah I mean this is this is something you see a lot of you know it's a, it's a buzzword and it's often a, a very useful concept in you know in the early moments of a transformative process but then can become very disempowering yes um, you know and you've seen that I think in in lots of places in Chile and Liberia and in South yeah. Africa obviously yes. and um, you know I, I find it a very impotent concept now in terms of my own my own experience of it and I was wondering if, if, if you had any, any thoughts on that yeah. um, th there's something that Walter Benjamin has it is called the, the historical index and uh, the historical index becomes something to think about both in terms of forgiveness <coughs> and also in terms of revenge um, What's tragic about every attempt at revenge is that it is, although it may, let's say, uh, kill the person, let's say, who killed your mother, but every act of revenge is not aiming to kill the perpetrator. In fact, according to Benjamin, he says that every act of revenge is attempting to kill and erase the historical index that separates you from the crime. And that is impossible. All right, so the act of revenge is attempting to, to collapse the time that separates you from the crime, not really to, uh, to kill the perpetrator. And every act of forgiveness is also an attempt to erase the index, the historical index. For Benjamin, these, no one can erase that historical index except, I mean, in, a, in his own kind of strange way, it's, the, it's God. Or something like God, right? <laughs> yes. But humans are incapable of doing that. I mean, think, you know, sometimes Hollywood films, as bad as they can be, sometimes they're very difficult because we often, we often see, uh, we often watch Hollywood films about, you know, revenge, right? And always revenge ends bitterly. There's something dissatisfying about it. Just the act, act of it doesn't do it for the, the person wants to avenge himself. And I think essentially this, what do you, so the question is like to go back is that the, the, the problematic is besides what do you do with this unerasable historical index? You can claim that through reconciliation, through forgiveness, or through, through vengefulness on the mm -hmm. other side, that we can do away with it. But if we realize that it cannot be done away with, then we need to reconceptualize Right. How we carry, right, the burden of history, and what do you do with it? Because in forgiveness, in, in vengefulness, in reconciliation, there's almost this hope that somehow this historic, this weight of history, is somehow, uh, let's say, you, you take it off your shoulders, yeah, and someone else takes care of it. The law, historians, whatever, just put it aside. And my guess, at least. Um, Work and what I try to do is that always remember that in fact it cannot be done, and if there's anything to be done, it must be done while carrying that history, literally carrying the weight of it. Uh, one last thing I mentioned to you before is the story of the, the, the Trojan prince Aeneas. There's a story uh, by Virgil of the, the fall of Troy. And the first part of the, of the book is uh, this prince, Aeneas, is, is recounting the fall of Troy. So, you know, towards the end of the, this first part of the, of the, of the book, uh, uh, Aeneas is watching, you know, the, the city of Troy in flames, right? And he runs back from the city to say what he can say, but he's, he just runs back from the city. He doesn't say why he ran back. And, and then he re-emerges from the, from the burning flames with his father on his back. Now his father is described as aging and decrepit, which is almost saying like death. Uh, so if you allow me to, to, to push, it's like he emerges from the fire carrying a corpse on his back. Right? And he 
walks out of the city and then he turns around and he says, quote unquote, I have lost and I know it. The question is, how come he can say I have lost and I know it while carrying the thing on his back? Is it, necessar is it necessarily because he carries his decrepit dead corpse like father that he can say I know it? Was he able to say something similar had he just ran out of the city by himself? You can take different interpretive view. But my, my, get, my interest is that it is only because he carries that he can say, I know. So the question is, and, and that, that thing he carries could be precisely that historical index. If you take it off him, you might feel, you might regain the levity of living. But you probably wouldn't be able to say, I know it. So it's a, it's a choice. Thank you. It's a choice. Yeah. It's a tough one. Thank you. Do we have any final comments? Um, yes. I just wonder whether the removal of the comma takes us from the maze into the labyrinth. So we leave the spatial direction into the temporal internalized. I, I mean, yes, in that direction, but as long, I know that the maze and the labyrinth are very seductive concepts. Uh, I just, uh, but I think that they, they cannot be thought separately, okay? Uh, you, you think the labyrinth and the maze, and they're both. If you separate them, I, I know there's their seduction, they become almost like solution to every problem that comes with the labyrinth, but together, together. And it's not, and again, what we remember that we never decide to enter a labyrinth. No one in his sensical mind will go into a labyrinth. Because it's to enter a non sequential time. No one will do this. But you might find yourself in a labyrinth. Yeah. But if you do, you probably will not be able to tell us about it. <laughs> I see, so, yeah. If you take it seriously, I think. Uh,